As Steve said earlier, NGA and INI have been very heavily involved in a lot of crown rot tolerance trials over the last three or four years. And although those trials started off particularly with a focus on crown rot, it was clear after about two years that we were seeing very compelling trends to indicate that thorny eye was having a big impact, and in particular was having a very, impact, very big impact in terms of the varietal results. There were 22 trials in that, that series of work, and what we were seeing was really the impact of thorny eye on yield, which is, as the first two speakers said, is what we see as tolerance. And that's where we were seeing up to a 30% yield loss in Streslecki. Um, you can do the maths very easily in terms of dollars per hectare that was being lost. About 10 months ago, though, we decided that those trial sites provided an ideal opportunity to really test out the other side, which is the resistance side of the, the story, and how these varieties were increasing nematodes. We did three sites last year, or oh, sorry, we did two sites, and Steve and Guy McMullen did a third site down at Canamble. And then we've also been testing over the last three or four weeks um, on sites with multiple varieties from 2010. Although some of this will be a little bit uh, of replication, this was the first data we had back in May, June last year, where there were three trials, there were eight different wheat barley and durum varieties which were sown at all those sites, at North Star, at Palatta and down at Canamble. And as you can see when you put them all together, you've, you've got the thorny eye population per kilogram of soil across the axis here. We had this group of durums at the top, some bread wheats and barley varieties close behind but then this very clear difference to a variety like Sunco with two to three times the number of nematodes. And as you can see with Streslecki, something like four to five times the number of nematodes. And when you see that pattern happening across three different trials scattered by 500 kilometres, you start to think there's some real effects going on. There were a number of other varieties that were only included at one or two of those sites. Steve put up the ones which are in green, which were the varieties at the Canamble site. We had an additional couple of uh, varieties, Ventura and Skiff, in the northern trials. And what I'm trying to show here, again, we had a couple of Durham varieties which have trended to the, the, uh, the bottom in terms of nematode buildup. Across the top here are those varieties from the previous slide, so you've got a little bit of an idea of where they benchmark. It's not perfect science, but it's as good as we could get from that data. And so certainly when you start to get down to varieties such as Ellison and Sunvex, you've really got some questionable build-up of Pratolinchus thornii. So we might not have the data yet in terms of what the best varieties are, but we've probably been able to identify fairly quickly four or five of those varieties which you've just got to avoid at all costs if you've got thorny eye in your country. To the recent data, so this is data, the samples were only taken three or four weeks ago. The data's probably only been available for a week. This is data from stripe rust trials. Any of you who were here yesterday, we were talking about work on moderately resistant stripe rust varieties. So we had multiple varieties, we've tested every site before planting. Moree and Toluna had um, reasonably high numbers of nematodes. And what we've done in the last few weeks is gone back in to sample those nematode numbers. And we've actually found some pretty consistent numbers between the, the trials. Again, if you look at the top, the two Durham varieties, Caparoy and Belleroy, certainly looking like they are better than the bread weights. There's a consistent message there. The only difference here from what we saw in 2009 or 2010 sampling is that Gregory has probably slipped back a little bit compared to Wiley. We had another site which was actually a herbicide plant pack site where we had a barley, a durum, a bread wheat and also a chickpea. This particular site, we started with 21,000 nematodes per kilo, and that's probably an unsustainable population for nematodes, and actually, 
it's come down with every one of those crops that were grown. Again, what are the messages here? Have a look at the top. It's the germ variety again, which seems to be holding that nematode increase a little bit lower. Barley a little bit intermediate. This is probably some data which might uh, not, not challenge what, what Kirsty's got, but might say we've got to look more at some of these chickpea varieties. Certainly Hattrick didn't perform very well in this particular situation. In terms of key messages, and I think you will have got them fairly soundly from most of the speakers this morning, germs in terms of the build-up of Pradlinkus thornii have been consistently fairly good. Um, they might not be reducing the numbers, but they're going to be holding them at a fairly low level. Barley and all this work, when we started it 12 months ago, we are expecting barley to be pretty well up towards the top. It's pretty intermediate. It's really in there with most of the, the bread wheats in terms of susceptibility. The bread wheats, a lot of them seem to be in that mid-category, but we are seeing some extremely poor varieties in there as well. And so there's, that, as I said before, four or five varieties you've got to avoid like the plague if you've got prattling thorny eye in your country. And as Steve said earlier, variety choice appears much more important for managing Pradlinkus thornii than it does in terms of crown rot. Conclusions, fairly simple. Know your paddock status, know your farm status. If you're lucky like Vic and at Condamine, there's a lot of soil types that don't have these nematodes. Now, you're in a great situation there. You want to avoid getting soil moved onto your property at all costs. If you've got it only in a couple of paddocks, try to change your practices so you're not moving it around on your own property. Certainly increase focus on variety selection. We were very comfortable there were big yield losses with some of these varieties under nematode pressure. But when you combine that with the nematode build-up we're seeing with varieties like Streslecki and Sunco and Sunvex and Ellison, you've got this double whammy effect going on. And that's apart from an additive effect on crown rot. And then finally, of course, start considering growing more resistant crops in those problem paddocks. This isn't, a pro this isn't a problem that you're going to eliminate over one year, two years, three years. It's something you're going to have to live with and manage. And those are the paddocks that you're probably going to have to increase your frequency of, of sorghum, might be dry land cotton depending on where you are, or some of the other crops with better resistance. Richard, just with that, that herbicide tolerance data, were those crops not around significantly by the herbicides? Just a bit worried about a mixed message coming out that we can put wheat varieties in a background of 20,000 nematodes and get a reduction. Um, like if they were not around by the herbicide, then you have less root exploration, then you've got less space for the nematodes. So I just don't think you can put wheat varieties in 20,000 and expect reduction. That's all just a bit worried about. Uh, the, the message I'm getting from looking at this sort of these trials over the last couple of years is there's so much that's still unknown, Steve. We've had a number of sites where nematode populations seem to go down and a number of sites where they go the other way. Um, that stripe rust data I put up where for each variety you basically have the same result. One of those started with 1,000 nematodes a year before and everything has increased them. The second site started with 6,000, and if you looked at the data, you'd say everything has decreased them. We know they're all susceptible, but there are different factors going on in the soil which are, are providing a handbrake, perhaps, in terms of their build-up as well.